It's always a joy to be at this conference, and uh, just to reflect some of the comments made, uh, it's been a great blessing to me, as well as to uh, several members of my family. We've benefited, we've been blessed. It's a particular delight to see people that were young people, very young, when I first got to know them, grown up, shepherding across the United States, Canada, and India. And uh, it's a special delight here uh, to be here tonight and this entire weekend as we discuss a topic that I think is absolutely critical, essential, vital to the successful functioning and ministry of the church as a whole in our individual assemblies. And without very much introduction, I would invite you to take your Bibles with that in mind and turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, I do want to get into this fairly quickly because trying to cover a topic like this in five or six sessions here and a few workshops throughout the weekend is a little bit trying to like uh, trying to bail out the Atlantic Ocean with a teacup. But uh, in the first six verses of Ezekiel 34, we see some criticism from God to people that are supposed to be doing the shepherding and they're failing. And God takes this very seriously, and therefore we ought to take it fairly seriously. But oftentimes when we try to define or describe what something is, we begin by describing what it isn't. And that's the approach that's taken here in the first few verses of this chapter. Uh, we can learn a lot about what we ought to be doing by seeing what God says about what these people are not doing. Now I'd like to read the first six verses with a few comments along the way. It begins this way. And the word of the Lord came unto me. And Ezekiel seems to emphasize that. It's not his words, it's not the words of men, it's Ezekiel's, or God's word, rather. He says, Son of man, prophesy, preach, teach, say to the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel. Now that word woe, it has in mind grievous distress affliction, trouble. It's an exclamation of lamentation. It's distress. God is warning these shepherds. He's saying, look, trouble is imminent here. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is obvious. Ye eat the fat. I want to pause there just for a second. The idea there, maybe a little bit obscure, is that these people that are supposed to be caring for other people are instead milking the sheep. They're making cheese and they're enjoying that. And uh, I was a little bit started to discover and doing a little bit of background reading on this that you can get 84 different kinds of cheese from sheep's milk. And the most common, uh, feta in ricotta, but 82 others, most of whose names I can't even pronounce. But they are taking advantage of the sheep. Ye eat the fat. Phrase number two, ye clothe you with the wool. They shear the sheep, make clothing. Ye kill them that are fed. The little lambs, as soon as they're big enough, they're butchered and they enjoy leg of lamb. But ye feed not the flock. The disease have ye not strengthened the some more modern versions say the weak, and I think that's the right way to say it, have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. Are you aware of any local meeting where force and cruelty is the norm? Hopefully not. Verse 5, and they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. To me, that last phrase is the saddest in this entire passage. Nobody cares. That's the idea. Now, through the course of this long weekend, we're going to learn a lot about what it means to shepherd. We're going to attend some practical workshops that tell us how to do that. But I wonder if the biggest problem isn't that we're just a little bit too lazy and this work doesn't have a high enough priority. Uh, let me begin with a fable. 
It's really intended for children. There are a few in the audience here, but adults will appreciate it as well, I think. Uh, it's an old story about a farmer that used to plow with a mule and an ox. He apparently was too poor to have a matched set. Planting season came. Every day he took the animals out, did the plowing. One night, the ox said to the mule, I'm sick and tired of this hard work. Let's pretend that we're sick tomorrow morning so we don't have to go out and do it again. The mule said, well, I like your thinking. I'm tired as well, but planting season, it really doesn't last, last that long. We've got to get the work done. We can't afford to do that. The ox didn't buy the argument. The next morning, he pretended to be sick. The farmer looked him over, gave him some good hay, some grain, took the mule, went out to do the day's plowing. At the end of the day, the mule comes back. The ox said, how did it go? And the mule said, well, okay, but we didn't get as much done as we would have if you had been there. The ox said, did the farmer say anything about me? Not a word. Ox thought he had a good thing going. Next morning, he pretends to be sick again. Uh, the farmer takes the mule out after giving the ox some hay and grain again. And at the end of the day, the mule comes back, all wore out, tired, bedraggled. And the ox said, how did it go? The mule said, not very well today. I just couldn't keep up with the work. I'm just shot. The ox said, did the farmer say anything about me? And the mule said, not a word, but he did stop and have a long talk with the butcher. <laughs> now, the Lord is not likely to take us to the butcher shop, but I wonder what he thinks and what he would say about our efforts. Are we lazy or are we doing this for his benefit? Are we willing? Are we available? Uh, all of us can quote Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice. And when I studied that some years ago, it struck me that the word present is the same word that's used in Luke chapter 1 and verse 19, when Zacharias asks Gabriel who he is. Gabriel is coming to announce the birth of John the Baptist. And Gabriel, in describing who he is, says, I am the angel Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. The word stand is the same word translated present in Romans 12.1. And when I discovered that, I asked myself, how long did Gabriel stand there in the presence of God, ready to be used, available? The old cliche, the best ability is availability. It may have been an hour. It may have been a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, a century, a millennium, standing there, ready for service. Our motivation ought to come from the mercies of God. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Take a look at everything that Christ has done for you. When you think about that, when you study it, you would ought to respond in service, in willingness. Our motivation also ought to come from our love for God. Before Christ descended into heaven, he took his disciples out for breakfast. And after they finished eating, I imagine Jesus looking across the table at Peter, staring into his eyes. Now, how would you like to stare into the eyes of the Lord Jesus shortly after you denied him with oaths and curses? I imagine it made him feel a little bit uncomfortable. And it probably was exacerbated because Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And the question was asked and answered three different times. And Peter's in distress. He says, you, you can see inside my heart and mind. You know that I love you. And Jesus, in essence, says, all right, I, I understand that that's what you say. And I understand you feel that, but I really want to see it put into action. So to prove that you love me, feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. If the Lord took us out for supper tonight, for breakfast tomorrow morning, and he stared at us across the breakfast table, what would he say? I think one of the things would be the very same thing. This is essential. You've got to be feeding my sheep. Notice they're not our sheep. The size of your Sunday school class is not there to build up your ego. The role that you have in your assembly, local church, is not there to enhance your status. These are Christ's lambs. We do it for him, our love for him. 
Now, uh, there's a little bit of an outline in the book, and I'm going to follow that fairly closely, I think. But point number one is the call for shepherds. We see it in verse 2, sort of indirectly. He says, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. He doesn't say, I wish there weren't shepherds. What I want are shepherds that do what they're supposed to do. And I also get the idea that God is calling for people with a shepherd's heart because of what we read at the very end of chapter 6, verse 6, rather. None did search or seek after them. That to me is so sad, as I already said. Now, if you get the idea that God is calling only those who are in leadership position, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. I really would like you to turn there just to point out something that's quite subtle. And as soon as I start quoting verse 11, you're going to say, oh, I know that, and stop turning. But uh, there is something I want to point out here. Paul is writing, and he says, God gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers or pastor teachers he's given those to the church with a capital c into the local assemblies now why the next verse tells us for the perfecting of the saints now i'm reading from the old king james version but all of the new versions and all of the commentators say that comma should not be there why did God, why did Christ, why did the Holy Spirit give these gifted individuals to the church? Well, number one, for the perfecting of the saints, some people say there's a second role, and that's to do the work of the ministry. Well, that's not the idea at all. You take out that comma, and if you've got a more modern version, it'll say for the perfecting of the saints to do the work of the ministry. It's you and I that are called on to do this ministry, to be the shepherds, and then it goes on for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, how do we do that? How do we shepherd? We're going to talk about that at length this weekend. Let me just start with a couple of the basics. Number one, what about the unsaved? Uh, Saturday morning, I think it is, we're going to talk about sheep that are not of this flock. Um, all of us have good friends that are not saved. Let me ask you to imagine something. Several years down the road, hopefully, not near term, but your friend dies still an unbeliever and then shortly after that you die let me further ask you to imagine that you could communicate heaven and hell your unsaved friend this good friend that you spent time with that you talked about sports and music and quilting and the news and weather and everything else what would they say to you at that point why didn't you share the gospel with me why didn't you tell me about christ why didn't you describe heaven and hell now, what are we going to say to that? Probably in a very quiet voice, we're going to say, well, you know, this is kind of a personal thing. and We don't really talk about religion and politics because it leads to arguments. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to be intrusive. I was afraid you might laugh at me. I was afraid you wouldn't take it seriously. You never seemed interested in serious things of life. How are those excuses going to sound at that point in time? Now, I say that to myself because I have a lot of friends that are not believers. And I say to myself, how many of them know the gospel? Um, there are people that are hurting as well. Take a look at verse 4. It says, the diseased have ye not strengthened. Not all disease or weakness is physical. All of you probably have friends that are hurting in one way or another. Uh, they don't have work, or the work is a little bit boring or there's some disappointment, uh, there's somebody hurting, there's a disappointment with family, whatever it may be. I think of a young lady in high school. Uh, she's not particularly bright. She's not drop-dead gorgeous. She's not witty. She's not popular. And as a result of that, she's a bit lonely. What are you gonna do for that young lady if you're another young lady that's in the same class? This is not just for elders. This is not just for Sunday school teachers. This is for all of us. We're to be involved in this. I was talking, I don't know how many of you know the name Jim McKendrick. Uh, he has spoke throughout the assemblies for many, many years. He's got serious back problems. I was just talking to him two or three days ago. And uh, he recently went through back surgery, actually a couple months ago now. But he said one of the things that blessed him the most was somebody sent him uh, some meditations on the Psalms. Now, he said it wasn't anything that I hadn't thought about, that I didn't really know, but I was blessed by the fact that somebody cared enough about me to send it. Uh, 
we can do that. Now, woe, right in the middle of verse 2. Punishment for those who don't shepherd. Um, some answer the call. Uh, maybe they want the status, the notoriety, whatever it may be, but they don't do it in the right way. They don't take it seriously. They're careless about it. And that word woe, uh, we've already defined it a little bit, but you know it's used throughout the Bible, right? You can go into the Old Testament, see it used there. The minor prophets use it. Jesus used it. Revelation is filled with it. And uh, it's sort of an aside. Um, you do read the minor prophets, right? Um, we're studying the minor prophets at our midweek meeting at Martin Road. Part of the reason is because of something I think I heard here uh, many years ago. Uh, somebody said, imagine for a moment that you die and go to heaven. And family and relatives and ancestors and all of that, they come up and, you know, glad to see you. I suppose you have mixed feelings about that. But after you get to chatting for a while, you know, you kind of disperse and go your separate way. But then here comes an older man walking up. He's got the beard. And he comes up and shakes your hand and says, good to see you here. My name is Obadiah. And after you talk a little bit, Obadiah says, I'm always curious what people think of the book that I wrote. And I'd like to ask you, what did you think of the thought flow? What did you think of my arguments? What do you think of the choice of words that I used? And you sort of hang your head and sort of mumble and say, well, you know, when I was reading through the Minor Prophets, I was sort of skim reading. Actually, in heaven, you can't lie, right? So you have to say, well, I never got around to reading it. And Obadiah is probably too polite to pronounce woe on you, but he would probably hang his head and slowly walk away disappointed. And uh, that struck us a little bit. We said, well, maybe we better look at this. But the woe is pronounced because these shepherds are profiting off the sheep and not doing anything for them. Eating the cheese, wearing the wool, eating the meat, but not feeding the flock. Now, there's an expectation for those who will shepherd, and that is that they feed. And we'll expand on that as the uh, week goes on. Now, you might ask, why the particular analogy of a shepherd? Why does the Old Testament and New Testament use that? Well, one of the reasons is because uh, Israel was filled with shepherds. And uh, if you get a Bible atlas and you study it a little bit, you'll discover that right in the middle of Judah, sort of almost uh, in the south center part of Israel, there is a high plateau. Depending on where you measure it, it's about 34 or 35 miles long, uh, 12 to 14 miles wide. It's rocky, the soil is thin, sandy. Not much will grow there. And so the only thing they use it for, and especially back in the time of the Old and New Testaments, was grazing sheep. A little bit of grass would grow there. And so everybody understood what shepherds were. They understood that. Uh, if you look in the book, uh, I saw my name somewhere and it says I'm from a town called Lenox, Michigan. That's a true thing. But before 1986, the area was called Muttonville. And you know what Mutton is, right? Sheep older than a year. Uh, the reason was the ground was so bad. And quite frankly, I wish somebody would have told me that before we bought a small farm here. Uh, but the ground is so bad, it's heavy clay, you can't get anything to grow well. You can't make a living there. So the people used to grow sheep, raise sheep, hence the name Muttonville. That was the idea here in Israel. In the life of a shepherd in Israel, in Palestine, it was hard and very, very difficult. There was little grass on that thin soil, so the shepherd had to constantly move the sheep around so that they were fed. The sides of the plateau at places were quite steep, and so the sheep on occasion would fall off the edge, and they'd fall into a ravine, and if they broke a bone or anything like that, uh, they're pretty much dead. Sheep have no desire to live. That's not the right way to say it. They don't have the instinct to fight for survival or anything like that. Sheep get just a little bit sick, they're done. And, uh, but if they don't break a bone or anything like that, the shepherd has to go down there and carry them back up. Now you think about carrying an animal that is fighting you that weighs 80 to 100, 150 pounds back up a cliff. And it's not easy work. There's wolves and other predators there. They had to protect the sheep against that. You know that David it says he protected the sheep against a lion and a bear. I wouldn't want to have to do that. Um, there were thieves and robbers. You know, before the Romans came in with their legions and the Pax Romana, uh, there were thieves all over the place. And they had to watch out for that as well. And so the shepherd's life was that of maintaining constant vigilance and fearless courage. 
against all of these things. Patience and love for the flock. And because of that, you see the idea of a shepherd throughout the scriptures. David in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Uh, you can read a little bit further. David said in Psalm 77, Thou leadest thy people like a flock. Psalm 79, We thy people, the sheep of thy pasture, will give thee thanks forever. Uh, Psalm 80, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, and on and on like that it goes. And the same analogy carries over to the New Testament, where the Lord Jesus Christ called himself the good shepherd, and so forth. We need to be caring for the sheep. So there's a call for shepherds with a shepherd's heart. Nothing is said about age. Nothing is said about experience. We will talk about feeding if time permits at the end. We need to know something about the Word of God. But especially, we better have a shepherd's heart for those around us. Secondly, the care of the shepherds. Not just the call of the shepherds, but the care of the shepherds. And we need to follow the Lord Jesus. Uh, he made an interesting statement uh, in Luke chapter 4. He walks into a synagogue and somebody hands him the Bible, the scriptures. And he opens up to an Old Testament passage and he reads this. We find it in Luke 4 verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. In other words, the diseased, the weak, the people that are hurting, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, I realize the words are a little bit different, but boy, that sure sounds similar to what we read in Ezekiel 34. Christ came to do what these shepherds that are referred to here did not do. Sheep need serious care. They're not particularly bright. They're not particularly fast. Um, sheep cannot clean themselves. I don't know if you knew that or not. Lots of animals can. Have you ever seen a cat? Uh, you watch a cat very long, you see that it is constantly licking its fur to clean itself. Dogs can clean themselves. Birds can clean themselves. Sheep cannot. Now we raise sheep on our farm, just a few, but uh, the best time of the year is in March and April when the lambs are born. And after they're three or four years old, you let them out into the pasture, and you can watch them. It's just delightful. If you just want to be entertained, that's a good thing to watch. They will sprint. They'll race each other across the pasture. And right in mid-stride, seemingly, they will jump three, sometimes four feet straight up in the air and come back down. In March and April, it is muddy. And you know what their feet are going to look like. When all the sheep go back into the sheep barn, after they're grazing out there, the dads and the moms will lay down on the straw. At that point, the little lambs play king on the mountain on the backs of the mother sheep. You know what that is? Um, the mothers are perfect. They just keep chewing their cud, perfectly content to let the lambs do that. One lamb will jump up on top of the mother, leaving the muddy footprints. And then all the other lambs tried to headbutt that first lamb off the mother. And it's a muddy mess when they're done. The sheep can't clean themselves. Uh, they've got to wait for the rain, but even that isn't sufficient. As soon as you shear the sheep, the first thing you've got to do is take the fleece to have it clean. Sheep cannot clean themselves. We are filthy with sin. Where do we go for cleansing? Well, obviously to the cross, to the Lord Jesus Christ, to our Savior. Uh, he cleanses us. We read throughout the New Testament. Sheep cannot defend themselves. There's lots of animals that do have a defense system. Uh, try to attack a skunk with a baseball bat and see how far you get. Um, you know what a blowfish is? Uh, try to whack a turtle with a baseball bat. He'll just smile at you. Uh, the exoskeleton protects sheep. Have none of that. No fangs, not fast, no defense mechanism. What's going to protect them from the wolves and the coyotes and the lions and all the rest? Well. That's what the Lord Jesus does for us. Our danger is from the evil one, Satan. But the power of God protects us. But I'm going to suggest it goes a little bit further. I'm going to suggest that the local congregation is protected from the evil one by people with a shepherd's heart. Now, let me take it one notch more practical. Who in your local assembly 
holds you accountable? Who comes up to you and says, what have you been reading in the Bible lately? How's your prayer life going? Uh, who have you witnessed to lately? Uh, who have you helped? Who are you holding accountable by shepherding? Sheep cannot find food and water for themselves. They depend on the shepherd to lead them to, you know, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Uh, do you know the significance of that? Uh, if sheep try to drink out of turbulent water, they'll drown because the proximity between their nose and mouth is so close that if they try to drink from bubbling water or anything like that, they'll suck up water into their nose and, and drown. They need the still water. The Lord Jesus does that. Do we prepare food in water for other people? When was the last time you can think of going to serious effort to help somebody get over a problem, to answer a question from the Bible or from life, some difficulty they're going through? Uh, they bring up a question in your high school class, in your college class, at work, whatever it may be. And you're going to take the time to go back and think about not only the right answer, but how you're going to present that answer to the person you're going to talk to in a way in which they'll listen, in a way in which they'll understand. You're not going to use complicated theological language. Uh, we'll say more about that later in the week. Sheep are not particularly intelligent. Uh, one of the most frustrating things about raising sheep is they're, they're to be crude, stupid. And uh, when it comes to the things of God, can we understand him? Uh, you try to understand the Trinity. Try to understand eternity past. I think we can sort of grasp eternity going forward. But what about in the past? Uh, inspiration of the scriptures. Uh, a lot of these things are beyond us and above us and all of that sort of thing. Um, in order to do this, we need to be strengthened. We get strengthened at a conference like this. We are strengthened by other people who care about us and shepherd and guide us and disciple us, all of that sort of thing. Uh, I don't have the time right now, but in my notes here, I have about eight passages of Scripture that tell us to be strong. And you know that they're all over the place. I was walking around the campus a little bit this afternoon, walked into the athletic building, and you walk into the lobby. You do this for those of you that are going to go over there, and you look up above, and it quotes Joshua, right? Be strong quotes the book of Joshua, quotes, quotes uh, God, but um, we need to be strong, we need to be strengthened. Now, care, what does it involve? The shepherd's care. Number one, it involves sacrificial service. The priority is on the sheep, not the shepherd. The shepherd is expected to work long hours. The shepherd is expected to fight the lion and the bear and the wolf and the bad weather and everything else for the sake of the sheep. Uh, we've got to be self-sacrificing. Now, we can't bear sin the way the Lord Jesus Christ did, but we can give up some things. When's the last time you gave up a simple thing like a television program so that you could go meet the need of somebody else? When's the last time you spent a little bit of money to help somebody out? When's the last time you used your brain to help somebody out? that had a need. You know, a lot of times we talk, as some people do anyway, about giving 10% of our income to the assembly. Let me ask you to broaden your thinking a little bit. What if you gave 10% of your time to the assembly? What difference would that make in your group? What if you gave 10% of your mental ability to your local church? How many years did you spend in school? And what do you do with that education? Well, I'm helping GE, I'm helping General Motors, I'm helping Honeywell, I'm helping this, that, and the other. How much of that education are you using for the Lord? Um, uh, sometimes we treat the things of the Lord a little bit like the uh, IRS. Um, what do I have to do? Uh, just something comes to mind here. Uh, you know the name H&R Block, right? When I was in college, I think it was college, uh, they were all the rage. You know, if you want to get your taxes done right, you go to H&R Block. There was another small company where I lived uh, on the west side of Michigan. Uh, it was called S&H Tax Preparation. 
And their slogan, um, if Uncle Sam wants it, let him come and get it. And I don't know if they're still in business, but the idea is don't give Uncle Sam any more than he absolutely demands. Now sometimes we say, what's expected of me? Is it my turn to teach the Sunday school class? Uh, everybody else has cleaned the chapel. It looks like it must be my turn now. Uh, if that's the attitude you have, God is no better than the IRS to you. Uh, do you know the name Robert Chapman at all? Uh, he was one of the uh, leading lights in the early Brethren movement back in the 1840s and 50s. And after a teaching session, there was a Q&A, and somebody asked him, would you advise young people, all the young people, to do something for the Lord? And Robert Chapman said no. And then he sort of smiled after a pause and said, I would advise them to do everything for the Lord. If you have that kind of attitude, that when you go to work, you're doing that for the Lord. Uh, when you go to the assembly, you're doing it for the Lord. Not for your education or entertainment, but for the Lord. And subsequently, other people. Uh, it'll change your life. Um, I don't know how many of you learned a little chorus when you were in Sunday school. How to spell joy, Jesus first, others second, yourself third, joy, J-O-Y. Um, I think that's legitimate. If you want to be happy, if you want to be joyful, that's the way to do it. Keep your finger here in Ezekiel, but uh, let me invite you to turn to John chapter 13. Uh, something struck me here some time ago. The beginning part of John chapter 13 talks about the Lord Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. When he is done with that, he tells them why he did that. Look at verse 14. Jesus tells the disciples, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. In other words, personal involvement. How involved are you in the lives of other people? What if you had to give a eulogy? For somebody else in this auditorium, could you do it? Do you know enough about that person? Uh, I'll come back to that thought in a little bit. Notice verse 15. Personal involvement, verse 15 says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. In other words, have the same attitude Christ had. Personal involvement with a Christ-like attitude. But it doesn't stop there. Notice verse 17. If you know these things, you know, it's one thing to know, but happy are ye if you... Do them. Personal involvement with a Christ-like attitude brings ultimate happiness. That's what we need to know. Now, how do you get personally involved in the lives of other people? Well, there's a thousand things we could talk about here. Let me call your attention, and you don't even have to turn here because you're going to know it well. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, the Lord Jesus gives us a prohibition. He says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. And then he goes on to tell us why. And we analyze that and we say, well, what's the problem here? Why did God tell us not to do this? Well, maybe it's hoarding. Lay not up. Well, you say no, because the very next verse, what does he say? But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Well, maybe the problem is selfishness. Lay not up for yourself. Uh, maybe I ought to lay this stuff up for my kids, grandkids, cousins, and people I don't even know. No, because in the very next verse, lay up for yourselves. Well, maybe the problem is treasures. No, because lay up for yourselves treasures. Well, the only thing we're left with is the place. And it prompts the question, how do we lay up treasure in heaven? Suppose I pull a $20 bill out of my pocket. There are two ways, at least, I could spend that money. I could go to Cracker Barrel and get a decent breakfast, spend it on myself. Or I could invite somebody out for coffee, even to Starbucks for coffee. And over the coffee table, I could learn a little bit about that person, their background, what their interests are, what they're struggling with, what they think about God. And maybe if I do that six or seven times, they'll know that I really care about them. And maybe they'll listen to the gospel and maybe they might even become saved. Let's imagine that person dies and goes to heaven. And then a couple years later, you die and go to heaven. What's that person in heaven going to say to you? They are going to be so appreciative that you laid up treasure in heaven in the person of another soul. Um, 
I am looking at the time here a little bit. Let me share a little part of my testimony with you. Um, I intended to do this, all right, so it's not like I'm going off on, on a tangent here. Uh, I grew up in a Christian home. I was saved in a vacation Bible school when I was eight years old. And if you would have watched me, you would have said, well, Don Graham is a pretty good kid. He does what he's supposed to do. He doesn't do the bad things, and that's the kind of person we want at Elko Baptist Church. Um, I went away to college, 500 miles away from home. And I'm sitting in a dorm room one afternoon when three guys knocked on my door and came in and they began to talk to me. Now, they knew that I was up there in part for sports and they began to talk sports, but they were very skilled at turning any conversation into a gospel presentation. And after about five minutes of chit chat, they began to talk about Christ. After two sentences, I said, hang on, I'm a Christian. Their response, fantastic. What are you studying in the Bible right now? Awkward pause. I wasn't studying, reading anything. How's your prayer work? They left the room, a few minutes later came back with a New American Standard New Testament. I've been addicted to the New American Standard Version ever since for my study. And uh, today, maybe it would be an ESV version or whatever it may be. They said, start reading the first chapter of John, and we get together on Thursday nights and we talk about it. Now, they made the Bible so fun, so exciting that it transformed the way that I approached the scriptures, Christianity, the Christian life, and so forth. It had a huge impact on me. Um, they made the Bible an exciting book. We'll say more about this for those of you that are gonna attend the uh, workshop on shepherding children, about how to make the Bible interesting and exciting. But God is very creative. God is interesting. God is exciting. We make the Bible boring sometimes. Uh, if you wanna make something boring, make biology boring, or history boring, or nuclear physics boring, don't make the Bible boring. God is very creative. Uh, I, it may have been Billy Sunday that said you can tell that because uh, God made the parrots and the monkeys and the elephants and some of you. Uh, I don't know what the audience thought about when he compared them to parrots and monkeys and all of that, but God is exciting. And uh, as you begin to study the Bible for yourself and do it seriously, you begin to discover all kinds of things. And when you do, Bible study becomes very exciting. Now, people did that for me. It's my responsibility to do that for others and those others to do it for others and so forth. Who are you helping discover the excitement of the scriptures? Are you personally involved in the lives of other people? Uh, I was mentioning to a young lady walking over here that uh, you won't know it because I'm a little bit used to standing in front of people, but I'm very introverted. I'm the kind of person you put in the back corner with a stack of books and a laptop computer and never say hi to me. I am perfectly content. And if you spend much time with me, you'll know that I'll never be the life of the party. I am not a gift of gab. I don't have the gift of gab at all. I'm not witty. I, I, you know, unless you're wanting to talk a little bit serious, I don't have a whole lot to say. I'm a boring person. I don't like people. Now that's an exaggeration. Don't take that seriously. But uh, the Bible says wrong attitude. Get personally involved in other people's lives. Uh, the work comes from the shepherds. Uh, you see a little note about that in your book. Um, small groups, very, very helpful there. Uh, sadly, for a lot of us, the small group is the midweek prayer meeting. Not many people show up for that. But you ought to be involved in some sort of small group somehow, sometime, somewhere, because those are the people that will hold you accountable. Those are the people that you can open up to. Those are the people that care about you, that will pray for you. And uh, on and on it goes. Uh, sacrificial service, we also need compassionate care. If you look at verse 4 in Ezekiel 34, every one of these phrases refer to people that need care. They are hurting people, hurting in one way or another. Lots of weak people out there. Some because they didn't grow up in a Christian home. Some because they grew up in a Christian home that didn't act Christian. Some because maybe they struggle studying the scripture. They're not uh, uh, geniuses or anything like that. But if you think about this concept, uh, the one another's, uh, how compassionate are you? Think about what's said in the Bible. We're to love one another over and over and over again. We're told to do that. Um, the Lord Jesus, a new commandment I give you. Now, was it new? Wasn't it in the Old Testament that we're to love other people? Well, of course. Well, what did Jesus mean, a new commandment? Well, there's a new standard. You're to love other people the way that I love you. That's what Jesus said. How did Jesus love? Well, he went to the cross for us. He continues to pray for us. Um, John, over and over, talks about that. 
Paul picks it up. Um, love isn't just mere sentiment. Uh, James talks about it too, right? Faith without works is what? Dead. Means nothing. James says, yeah, I, I want to hear about your theology. I want to know what you believe. I want to know what your statement of faith is, but I really want to see it in you. Um, I have an old tractor. It was built in 1921. It's a heavy 10,000 pound steel monster. And uh, in order to see whether or not the level of oil in the crankcase is correct, you've got to get on your hands and knees and there's a glass tube underneath. And if the oil is halfway up the tube, you know the right amount of oil is in that tractor. If there's no oil visible in the tube, you better not start the tractor. If the oil is all the way to the top of the tube, you better not start it, you're gonna overpressurize the crankcase. Um, James says that, I wanna see that glass tube of your life. I wanna see your theology put into practice. And I want to see a loving other people with sacrificial service, with compassionate care. Uh, we're to serve one another. We're to forgive one another. How often are you willing to do that? We're so willing to hold a grudge. Uh, we're to confess our sins to one another. We're to instruct one another. That's absolutely key. Uh, we're to encourage one another. Um, if I were to ask you right now to stand up and give me three things the Lord has done for you this week, could you do it? Now, I'm going to make some assumptions here. My guess is that 50% at least would struggle a little bit. And when you did get up and talk about things, you talk in generalities. I'm thankful for my salvation, for the family, for my health, for the safe trip here, stuff like that. If, if you wanted to get any more specific or, uh, you know, thankful or detailed or anything like that, you'd have to struggle a little bit. But suppose I said, I'd like for you to stand up and give me five things, not three, five things I could pray for you about. You can do that in seconds. We dwell on the negative so much, right? And therefore, we need to encourage other people. Let me be silly for a moment. I, I didn't see where Elsa and Abraham sat down, but I'm sure he'll forgive me for this, all right? I'm going to pick on him. This is not true, what I'm going to say. But let's imagine for a moment, Elsa had an 80-year-old neighbor lady that was widowed. She broke her leg. Uh, Elsa, out of compassion, goes out and buys groceries for her, sweeps the sidewalk, vacuums the carpets, even cleans the toilet. But he also had to make a car insurance payment. So he gets a pistol, and he robs two liquor stores and three gas stations. And say, yeah, that's Elsa. Um, which one of those, we get together on Wednesday night, which one of those are we going to talk about? The benevolence or the crime spree? 99% of us. Why? Well, one reason is easy to understand. If we make Elsa look bad, by comparison, we look pretty good. But I think there's a whole lot more to it than that. And I'll leave that for you to figure out. If you have a hard time getting to sleep tonight, think about why it is that people dwell on the negative so much. People need encouragement. Are we going to encourage them? How are we going to encourage them? Um, well, there's a lot more to say here, but uh, lots to do. We've got to feed. In order to do that, we've got to be fed first. The Lord Jesus gave Peter breakfast in John 21 before he said, you go feed. I began with a fable. Let me end with one. It's the story of an old hermit that lived in a cabin in the hills of Tennessee. He always used to be able to answer all of the questions that the young people brought to that hillside cabin. And he was a wise old man. But in every community, there's some troublemaker, one borderline delinquent, uh, one person that's always getting into trouble and getting his companions into trouble because of their association with him. And there was one such person in this community, and one day he gathered his friends around him and said, you know, I've come up with a clever way to make that old man in the mountains look foolish. I'm going to trick him. I'm going to catch me a bird, a small bird, and I'm going to hold it cupped in my hands. And I'm going to go up and knock on that cabin door, and the old man will come to the door, and I'm going to say, old man, what do I have in my hands? And he'll say a bird. He always gets everything right. And I'm going to say yes. But is the bird alive or is it dead? If he says the bird is dead, I'll open my hands and let him watch that bird fly away and we'll prove that he's wrong at this point. If he says the bird is alive, before I open my hands, I'll crush that bird to death. And I'll open my hands and the bird will be dead. He'll be wrong again. So the young man went out and caught himself a bird, went up to the cabin, knocked on the door. The old man came to the door, and the young man said, What am I here, old man? And uh, the old man said, Well, it looks like you've caught yourself a bird, boy. And then the boy looked at his companions out of the corner of his eye and said, Yes, but is the bird alive or is it dead? 
And the old man looked at him and said, It is as you will. Now that's the sum of it. You've captured the bird of Christian shepherding. The issue is, are we going to watch it and feed it and watch it grow and watch people grow? Or are we going to neglect it and starve it and let it die? It is as you.